time when the dawn of independence was just over the horizon. It was a time of testing boundaries. Africans would push back against the racist policies of the Rhodesians, and the Rhodes would push back in a manner that we now commonly associate with the colonial hangover. I drove out to Chimani Mani for work. If you've ever been there, you know, the landscape, it's so wonderful. The mountains, the green, it's really something else. Anyway, I drove out to Chimani Mani for work, and I decided to take a stop at the country club. Now I'm sure you can imagine that country clubs and their sprawling golf courses were undoubtedly segregated. Only gardeners, uh, maids, caddies made into those places. So I walked in, and of course, all eyes were on me. But I didn't give a damn. I went to the bar, I sat on a stool, and I ordered a Bollinger's. And just as my beer came, a short, thick-necked Rhodesian came, took my glass, and he stuck his middle finger into my beer. Ah, excuse me, mate. I'm just making sure it's cold enough for you. And like that, he chuckled and he waddled away to his friends. Was I livid? Of course. But what could I do? I picked up my things and I left. Why die for a beer?
we had to do three months on the ground before we went into the air. First day of class, this white girl came, Lynn Saunders. She was one of the trainees. I was sitting with Auntie Loveness and them. There were only eight blacks when I joined Air Zimbabwe. So anyway, she walked and said, I am Miss Lynn Saunders. I am the senior instructor here at Air Zimbabwe. Can I have your first names? Auntie Loveness looked at her and said, why should, you give, why should we give you our first names? You told us you are Miss Lynn Saunders. Well, then I am Miss Loveness Macombe. What shocked her was this was the first time she was in a classroom with qualified women. I was a qualified nurse at the time, and I had just spent some time in England, and Auntie Loveness was just coming from Impilo Hospital. I remember our first flight. There was, of course, first class, business class, economy class. So obviously, as a junior, you started work in economy class. And then they would say to us, you don't come to first class. You must phone. So unfortunately for them, Auntie Loveness and I were put in economy class together. So what would happen is after food service, <clears throat> the food in first class, which was the best thing ever, the senior would bring it to us. So one day, we waited, we waited, waited, and no food came. So what did I do? I walked straight into first class. And the senior there, I remember her name was Rosie Field. She looked at me and said, what on earth are you doing here? And I said, why on earth are you shouting? <laughs> you can speak to me nicely. She said, you know the rules. You're not supposed to come here. And I said, as long as it's written, Air Zimbabwe outside, I am in Zimbabwe, and I go wherever I want. So I have come for my food. And she gave it to me. <laughs> and just like that, we were the first to change everything there because the racism was still, <coughs> still very much so. So from then on, whenever you wanted food, all you had to do was call first class and say, I'm coming for my food. And they didn't stop us. And that was because of me and Auntie Loveness. But, you know, South Africa was still South Africa. I remember one flight, one of the boys said to me, I have a whiskey and water, and the Piccanini Madame wants an orange juice. I stopped. I beg your pardon? Who, who is Piccanini Madame? Whose Piccanini Madame are you talking about? When I tell you this was a seven-year-old girl, I said to him, I will not serve you unless you ask me with respect, and I went. And he rang and rang and rang the bell, and I had to tell the white flight attendant, can you answer that bell because I'm not serving that man with the child. We used to have so many problems on the South African flight. We had piles and piles of reports. And I'm sure they were all in my name because we were name badges at the time. And I was, I was notorious. <coughs> so we had a meeting with management. And that Lynn Saunders woman, mm, <laughs> She said, you know, sir, we must talk to these girls. We're having so many bad reports. And I said, well, sir, we fly to Frankfurt. We fly to Athens. We fly to Paris. Fantastic reports. Why are all the bad reports coming from South Africa? It's because of the situation in South Africa. And from then on, how could, how could he take those reports seriously? So... We were in line for tickets at the movie. It was Union Avenue. And uh, somebody, somebody pushed me in line, and I was pushed into this white guy. And my gosh, he spit at me. I remember it very, very well. He didn't say, why did you, nothing. No, he just, he spit at me. I think I was with Mavis. I just had to move back and wipe myself. It was the end of term, and I was in Form 1. Yes, I think it was in Form 1 at Goromonzi. I couldn't wait to be back at Harare. So I got off the train at First Street with my friends. I wanted to go to the supermarket to buy some custard and jelly. 
at the time, well, you know, we didn't have deep freezes, but I was so sure that I could get that jelly to set if I left it on the roof <coughs> overnight. And once that jelly set, I would bake a vanilla sponge cake, slice it up, and make some sweet trifle for my baby sisters. Oh, that was always my special treat for them. Anyways, I walked briskly to the supermarket. You see, my father would be there in a matter of minutes and ish, mm, 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 he did not like it when I kept him waiting. So I walked briskly, imagining the smile on my sister's face as I fed her some sweet trifle. Ah, I missed them so much and I was so excited <coughs> to see them. Absent-mindedly, I walked right into a white family on the sidewalk and I was jerked back into reality when a cold, thick saliva slid slowly down my face. The small white boy had spit on me. On me! So I raised my hand and I slapped him. <laughs> ah, yes, the silly child. Of course, his parents dragged me to the police station and the policeman said to me, don't you know you're not allowed to walk in the pavement, Kaffa? How dare you hit a piccanini bus? What? A piccanini what? A piccanini bus? <coughs> what made that nine-year-old brat my boss? I was 13 years old and I was more civilized than his stupid spitting self. Clearly, his parents had taught him no manners. So I stared up at the policeman and he shrunk before my eyes. Ah, but it was unfair. Why was I being shouted at for hitting him? Why was no one shouting at him for spitting on me? Resentment swelled in my heart. That boy, he will never be forgiven. My father was a minister of religion, apostolic faith mission. It was a white church, so every time Mr. Um, Wilson came, everyone had to give offering and he would take everything with him. But on the Sundays that my father was preaching, no offering would be taken. My father couldn't touch the church's money. I was in sub A or sub B, which is like kindergarten, and that was my first exposure <coughs> to racism. I remember I said, oh, this white reverend can take money from us, but my father cannot touch the money. My father wasn't paid. He had to have private businesses on the side. He used to order used clothes from the Belgian Congo, now DRC, and sell them. That was my introduction to this unequal treatment. And as you grow up, you go to downtown Salisbury, and as an African, if you want to buy something, you don't just walk into a shop. You have to buy it through the African window. I remember this one time, after my father bought some furniture, he asked them, but how are you gonna bring it up? Wasn't it I who bought it through the African window? I expect my furniture to come out that window too. He just wanted to make a point. In terms of schooling, blacks had their own education system called African education. There was a department for coloreds, another for Indians, and then there was the European education system. There were courses that weren't taught to Africans. Blacks who wanted to study medicine or law had to go to South Africa and study at apartheid universities just for Africans. Even in town, it's obvious. If you're walking in the stoop and there's a white family coming from there, you risk your life. You have to step into the street so that a white man woman or white child can pass. You can get a six-year-old boy slapping a 65-year-old man, and he won't say anything but, ah, thank you, Piccanini boss, wear his hat and go. 
But if a black man is walking on the pavement and he accidentally rubs his shoulder against a white woman, he would go to jail. Another ridiculous thing is all the European beers, your whiskeys, brandies, anything distilled or refined wasn't sold to Africans. And if an African was caught with a bottle of brandy, he would go to jail. <coughs> You're only allowed to buy KB, Kaffir beer. That's the only thing you get legally anyway. <sighs> Anything else? Jail. Even the shop would be in trouble. Africans used to pay a white man or a color to go and buy liquor for them. Because colors were white men's children.